Hi everyone! Um, today I decided I would answer some kids questions about dogs. So today I was actually supposed to be at the New England Federation of Humane Societies giving a panel discussion or at least going and getting ready for that panel discussion with some friends of mine um, and because of COVID-19 we're not able to do that. So I decided instead of trying to do that presentation or being sad about being locked in home like I'm sure many of you guys are too, I thought maybe I'd reach out to my friends on the internet and have them ask their children what questions they had about dogs and that I could take some time and answer some of those questions. And some of these are really good and I'm very excited to get to them. Some of them I had to work really hard for. <laughs> so let's get to it. So my friend Taryn, age seven, he asks, um, let's see, how far can a dog smell? That is an excellent question, Taryn. Um, it reminds me of a joke, actually. My father-in-law's favorite joke to tell is, how far can a dog smell? A mile. Further if he's wet. Haha. -ha. But in all seriousness, dogs can smell over a mile. Um, using that super sniffer nose, I'm going to put a link to another video up here about um, how dogs use their, their nose to find things and um, how important that nose is. So if you're more interested in how the dog's nose works, you can look here or here or wherever the link ends up showing up. Um, but there's lots of science about how dogs' noses work. But for fun, um, you can train your dog to find things with their nose, which is really cool. My dog Captain finds birch and anise and clove. We also take his food and we put it in a puzzle toy and then we hide it somewhere in the house or in the basement and then he has to go looking for it with his nose. It's a lot of fun to watch him work and to have him work for his food. Bomb detection dogs, they can also smell um, explosive uh, devices, chemical compounds, and the plastics that they use for fuses. Um, so these dogs are awesome. Dogs can also smell cancer. Um, they can smell it in urine, in your breath, and also in your skin. Um, they can also find items buried 40 feet underground. So if you think about a basketball hoop, that's 10 feet. <laughs> um, that's 10 feet high. So if you were to take four basketball hoops at 10 feet and stack them on top of each other, that would be as far down into the ground that your dog can smell. How cool is that? They can smell 80 feet. That's eight basketball nets underwater. So just being on top of the water surface, they can sniff down 80 feet. Um, well, uh, there are also conservation canines who can detect whale poop from over a mile away. And these conservation canines help uh, researchers find whale pods. So they can study these whales um, to see if maybe they're sick or how, um, how their ecosystems are changing and how their migration patterns are changing because of climate change. So these dogs are really, really impressive and those noses are super useful to humans. The next question I have, Riker age five and May age three, they're siblings and they each have asked a question. Riker asks, why can't dogs stand up? Well, Riker, hey buddy, how are you? Um, they do stand up. They just stand up differently than we do. Um, their standing up looks a lot different than our standing up. Um, but you can teach them to walk on their hind legs. It's a trick. Um, it's really hard for some dogs to do because they're not, if you, when we get to the bones later, we're gonna talk about the anatomy of dogs. Um, but it's really hard for them to do so because they have to kind of stand up and use their core muscles and their back muscles to get up on their legs, which aren't really designed to walk like this. Um, but uh, my former dog, Sadie, she used to stand up and walk on her back legs a short distance. And we used to call it Evolve because I thought it was a really funny trick name. Um, but if you look up fun dog tricks, you can find all sorts of examples of dogs walking on their back legs. So if you wanted to Google, um, let's see, have your mom help you look for freestyle dog dance or freestyle disc dogs. And you'll see lots of examples of dogs standing on their back legs, which I think is what you might have actually been asking. Um, and May asks, why do they always lick me? And May is age three. Well, May, they always lick you because since you're three, you're a lot lower to the ground than I am. So they can reach you easier and you probably just ate Cheetos. So you taste delicious. Um, but more seriously, um, dogs lick for a variety of reasons. It releases endorphins, which is a chemical compound in the brain that it's basically a happy chemical, right? So when you're licking an ice cream cone, I bet you're happy, right? And some of it's the sugar, some of it's that it tastes good, but licking, especially for dogs, releases these happy chemicals. 
And me as a dog trainer, if I'm working with a dog that might be stressed out, I might give them something to lick, like um, a toy called a Kong, and I might stuff it with peanut butter and have the dog work on that while I'm working with the family to try to help the dog feel better. Um, it's just something that we can do to kind of help these dogs. Um, the other thing is they get attention for it. So when they lick, you might look at them. And so dogs do almost always what works. So if they lick you and it works, they're gonna do it again. Um, some dogs do a kiss to dismiss, which is a lick and then you get up and walk away. So that can be a precursor for some, um, for some more, maybe more serious behaviors. So if it's happening a lot, you might wanna talk to your mom and maybe see if there's a way for you to get some space from your puppy. Um, but um, licking releases endorphins and let's see, do, 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 do. but if a dog is constantly licking, there might be a medical issue, especially if they're like licking their leg a lot and then you can see that there might be a cut um, or an injury. Um, dogs will also lick if they're hurt on the inside. So if they hurt their knee or their hip, you might see them licking that area quite a bit. Um, or if they were bit by an insect. So you, if you're seeing a lot of consistent licking on the dog, you might wanna have your mom take your doggy to the vet and get a, clip, a quick look. Um, some medications also might help uh, make a dog lick a little bit more. So if you have any questions about excessive licking, definitely call your vet. They're, they're your dog's friend and they wanna help. Then we have Quinn, age eight. She asks, how fast is the fastest dog? Quinn, did you know that greyhounds can reach 40 miles an hour? They can hit that in two strides. That's two steps. And what's interesting about the greyhound is while most dogs, um, all four of their legs come out. Let's see if I can show you. All four of their legs, boop. <laughs> this is really hard to demonstrate. Uh, there we go. So when a dog is running, boop, boop, run, 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 run. Um, when they're at a full stride, all four feet are off the ground at once during one stride. And then all four feet, and then all four feet. And Greyhound, they open up all four feet twice during one stride, when they're all the way out, and then when they come all the way back in. So their back is built a little bit differently, their muscular structure is a little bit different, so they can get two big steps where their legs are all the way out, and off the ground twice during a single stride. Um, they also, we also tend to think that they're so fast that they need a lot of exercise, but that's not the case. Um, these dogs um, are awesome apartment dogs because while they're sprinters, they sleep after they do their big run. So they might run around really fast for two or three minutes and then be done for three or four days. Now you still have to walk these dogs. They still have to go for little walks, but they're great apartment dogs because they like to kind of hang out and go for little walks and then every now and again, a big burst of energy and then they're done. Um, they're really sweet. They're a lot bigger than most people think. Um, our greyhound was about 70 pounds. I've seen 80 pound greyhounds. Some of the females are a little smaller, about 60, um, but they're very, very sweet, loving dogs. So if you're thinking about um, maybe having a lower energy apartment dog, a greyhound is a great one. Let's see. Lydia, age kid at heart, asks, can dogs cry? Well, the shorter answer is yes, but not the same reason that we cry. Humans, as far as we know, are the only animals that cry, that consistently cry for emotional reasons. So if we've just watched Six Feet Under's finale, or uh, Bambi, or any number of things, we will cry. Um, or if we had a really bad day, we might cry. Um, but Dogs cry when they have like an irritant. They also have tear ducts like we do. Um, so if there's an irritant in there or maybe an allergy, you might see some weeping. Um, it, um, after anesthesia, I've seen some dogs kind of lose um, some liquid out of their eyes. Um, if there's a scratch or an infection or an irritant, it's really important to make sure that if you see a lot of weeping or leaking of the eye, or even if it looks like tears, call your vet and have a quick chat with them because sometimes it, it might be that there's an allergy that you can easily fix or maybe that there's something just really stuck in there and then the vet can kind of help rinse it out, make your puppy feel better. Excellent question. This is one I had to look up. All right, Zoe, age six. She asks, some dogs chase cats, why? Well, dogs do what works. Remember when we were talking about licking, right? So, some dogs 
have this thing called prey drive. And what prey drive is, I see a prey animal like a rabbit, squirrel, cat, and I need to chase it. So that's how we get greyhounds to run around the track. We have a pretend bunny on, on, a, on a track and it runs out in front of the greyhounds and that's why the greyhounds run because their brain is like, I see the bunny, I have to get it. So some dogs are really driven to chase prey. And there are some breeds out there like border collies where we can use that prey drive. What they really wanna do is catch the thing. Um, and we have bred for centuries into the border collie that they want to chase down these animals, but not attack it, not hurt it. Instead, they herd it. So they, maybe a sheep gets out. So you send your border collie out and it comes around and it collects the sheep and he brings them back. So we humans have been breeding for more prey drive or a specific kind of prey drive for centuries. And there are other dogs that we have bred or we've tried to breed out some prey drive behaviors out of some dogs. So some have high prey drive, some have low prey drive. And that's something to consider if you're getting a dog into your home and you have cats. Um, some dogs who have high prey drive for one thing might not have that prey drive for anything else. So example, our Greyhound Zeppelin. Loved rabbits, loved. <laughs> but he had a high prey drive for rabbits and very little else. So we had two kitties in our home, it was fine with them. Our current dog captain, he loves, oh, he just saw me. I, just, I said his name and he looked up. Um, he has prey drive for cats who are outside, but not the two kitty friends that we have inside. And there are plenty, and I'll put some pictures up here of him snuggling with our kitty friends in the house. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, can you, a follow-up question, uh, can you train them not to chase cats? Well, depending on the dog, you can. Um, if they're just kind of being playful, um, and it's not like significant predatory behavior where they really want to hurt the kitty, um, then it can you can work really hard and you can train the dog not to chase the kitties. Um, it takes a lot of management, a lot of time, um, but you can do that. Um, but if you have a dog that has high prey drive for your cat, then it might be better if that dog and that cat don't live in the same home together. And if you go through a rescue or through a breeder, you want to make sure that you're looking for a dog that can live and coexist peacefully, peacefully with kitties if you have kitties in your home. My expected follow-up after that question is, Mom, can we get a dog to be friends with our cats? Good luck with that, Kara. Kara is Zoe's mom. Uh, Travis, kid at heart, he asks, do dogs know dogs are dogs, even if they all look different? I really like this question a lot. Um, so dogs are one of the most diverse creatures on the planet. Um, as far as like domestic animals and mammals are concerned, they're one of the most diverse from the smallest teacup chihuahua, like at two and a half to three pounds, to the greatest Great Dane, the biggest Mastiff, these giant dogs that you see that are over 150, 200 pounds. Um, but even dogs who have no face, we call that brachycephalia. So like if you've seen like a pug, looks like it ran into a wall. Um, or the dogs with the long noses, again, going back to a greyhound. Um, or even medium snouts or tails that curl or tails that are flat or tails that hang low or tails that are bushy or dogs that are bushy. Dogs like people look very, very different. And we know people are people, right? Because we have different cues. We can see people and say, well, even though their skin is different, we know that that's a person. Even though their hair is different, we know that's a person. Um, even that person might wear glasses or jewelry. It's still a person. And we know that they're people because they have uh, similar mannerisms. We all communicate with our mouth. We all make eye contact when we say hi to each other. Um, we might have different greeting rituals. So like I hug a lot of people and there are certain cultures where hugging isn't appropriate or comfortable. Um, but we all can recognize people are people. And dogs, I feel, do the same thing. They do that weird circle-y thing where they go nose to butt to say, hey, how are you? I'm a dog. Um, so most of a dog, um, their information coming in is via their nose and their, uh, their nasal organ. So if they're trying to figure out, hey, pug, are you a dog? They're going to get some scent that indicates that this is a dog. They might see some play bows or dog-like uh, communication, um, they might growl, and a dog would certainly understand what that means. 
they would be looking at the ears. Are they communicating back to them in a way that they might understand? Now, that's not to say that dogs um, can't um, can't misread the situation. Um, there are certain dogs that might not be able to play well with each other. My current dog, Captain, he's a brawler. So he might not be able to read the room, as it were, if he's playing with maybe a more sensitive dog. He likes to throw his body at dogs and kind of ricochet off of them. Um, whereas some other dogs, they don't like that kind of play. And just like with people, some of us like to go to raves and some of us like to stay at home and watch Netflix. So there are different games that people like. There are different games that dogs like. It Dogs know that they are dogs. And part of it is watching them try to figure out how they can coexist with other dogs. Great question. Rohan, age nine, Harper, age five, and Olivia, age six. They all asked anatomy-specific questions. Um, how did their bones work? I know they look different from ours. Oh, that was from Rohan. Uh, Olivia, I want to know more about anatomy, exclamation point. And Harper, how many bones are in a dog's body? All right, so dog's bones, let's start with Rohan's question. Their bones work exactly like our bones do. They provide structure and they, they offer protection for like our heart and our kidneys and our internal organs. Um, they, they allow muscles and tendons and ligaments to connect so we can move and we can uh, pick up paper. Uh, dogs can't pick up paper, they don't have thumbs, but you know what I mean. Interact with the world around us. Um, and while our bones are laid out differently um, from a dog, in many cases we have very similar bones. So if you can see on the screen here, we have like you can see that there are ribs and that there's a skull and that there are vertebrae and that there are leg bones and other leg bones because they have four legs. Um, and you can see that there are many similarities between a person and a dog. It's the way that the shapes of the bones are different because a dog's existence is on four legs. So those leg bones are going to look maybe different, especially the front legs. Their humerus is smaller than their ulna and their radius, which are, for us, the ulna and radius are these two bones here at the, um, the bottom of our arm. This is, you know, our forearm, and we have two bones, the ulna and the radius. And the humerus goes from our shoulder to our elbow, and that is the longest bone in our arm. For dogs, that's reversed. So their long bones are down here, and their short bones are here. Isn't that fun? The same with their, well, their back legs, I actually don't know enough about anatomy, so you might have to have your parents help you look that one up. Um, but humans have 206 bones in our body, unless we've had an accident of some kind, um, or might have been born maybe with fewer bones. But for the most part, most humans have 206 bones, and there are 100 bones-ish in our hands and our feet alone. The rest of our bones give us structure and protection. For dogs, on average, they have about um, 320 bones. So they have more bones than we do. More of them are in their tail. We don't have one of those. Most of us don't have one of those. Um, but depending on the length of their tail, they have longer vertebrae and tail bones. They also don't have a collarbone, which is really interesting. That's this bone right here that connects our shoulder to underneath our neck. Um, so it's interesting to kind of see the differences. So maybe one thing you can do during the quarantine is put up a, um, a picture of a human skeleton and a dog skeleton and see if you can find uh, 10 things that are the same and 10 things that are different. I think that might be a really fun project for those of you that like anatomy. Um, let's see. And, how, and Harper had asked how many do bones are in a dog's body. Again, around 319. Some have fewer, some have more, depending on the length of the tail. Um, but it's in that ballpark. They have more bones than humans. Avery, age three. This is my favorite question. How can you make a dog's poop smell not as bad? Well, you could wear a clothespin. You could, you could spray it with maybe some potpourri smell. But or you could get really creative. Poop is basically a fertilizer, right? So as it gets all wormified and composted into the ground, you can maybe pray, uh, put some flower seeds on it and next year you'll have a beautiful garden and it might attract bees and butterflies and I guarantee you that'll smell better than dog's poop. Dash age 11, how do we know what dogs are feeling? And from a more serious perspective, this is also another of my favorite questions. And here's why. Dash, my entire job 
as a dog trainer is looking at a dog's body and trying to figure out what they're telling me or what they're telling their owner. Um, and as a teacher, I have to be aware if a dog is scared or nervous or, or uh, angry or happy or overwhelmed or uh, reacting to something in its environment that makes him uncomfortable or her uncomfortable. So I have to be really aware of what a dog is telling me all the time. Um, and they tell me how they're feeling with their voices. They can bark, they can yip, they can growl, they can howl, they can yodel. There's a, 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 there's a yodeling dog out there. Maybe that'll be a fun experiment for you to try to find the name of the breed of the dog that yodels. Um, but one of my favorite people on this planet, her name is Lily Chin, and she, she has spent her, uh, her career creating these great informational graphics that I can use as a teacher and that you can use as a student, even a young student at age three or 11 or 15 or 30. You can use these posters to educate yourself about what a dog is feeling and you can start to see some of these things out in the real world. Um, so they are constantly using their bodies to talk to me. Um, and if you have a dog, maybe one thing you can do is take a piece of paper and a pen and just sit and watch your dog. This is what um, ethologists do. They sit there and they observe. They don't really interact, they just observe. So when your dog is eating their bone and maybe a cat gets a little too close, what does the dog do? Does he freeze? Does he give whale eye, which is looking to one side and then you just see the whites of the eye? Does his mouth close? What do his ears do? What do his hackles do? The fur on the back of his neck. When your dog is really happy, what does he do? Where is his mouth? Is it open or closed? Is he leaning forward or back? Is his ears forward or back? Um, what are his eyes doing? Are they big and bright? Or are they just kind of squinty and is he blinking a lot? All of those things tell me as an instructor uh, that I need to be reading the situation and then acting accordingly. Um, these are all excellent questions, guys. Um, so check out Lily Chin's stuff at doggydrawings.net. Um, and, and just have a field day with that. The drawings are beautifully done. And that's it. Thank you so much to all the kids and the kids at heart for sending in your questions. If you have other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm at considerationsbook at gmail.com. Um, and um, I wrote this book, Considerations for the City Dog, a few years ago. And if you're curious and you want to pick it up, you can get it on Amazon digitally. I think it's about six bucks. Um, if you prefer a physical book, you can go ahead and order that at wherever you feel comfortable ordering that book. Um, I'm the oldest, I'm the co-training director of the oldest AKC Obedience Club in the country, the New England Dog Training Club. And we're here and we're still giving videos out to our students and to people who are kind of following along trying to stay sane and play with our dogs during COVID-19. So if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you can, if you have any topics for me to cover, I would also love to hear from you. So you can find me through any of these channels. I'm on the Facebook group, uh, Mutt Stuff, or you can also find Considerations for the City Dog on Facebook. You can at me at Mutt Stuff on Twitter, uh, Melissa McHugh McGrath on Instagram, and my website is melissamchughmcgrath.com. Have a great day, guys, and keep those questions coming. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity today.